test, test. Good morning, everybody. What a joy to be in worship with you here today, to get back to something that feels normal to me <laughs> instead of the routine of these past few weeks. I'll say a little bit more about that later, but thank you for coming to worship today, and welcome to you. We've got uh, a welcome on the screen there. I want to uh, remind you to please take a moment to sign in on the Friendship Pew Pad, which is on the inner aisle, and we're especially happy that you're here. If you're a visitor with us today, help yourself to one of the Congregational Church Cups. You'll find all manner of interesting information about us, upcoming events, and a little bit about our beliefs and, and all of the rest. So a quick reminder that uh, our Bountiful Basket is going to switch gears beginning in March. As Judy pointed out last week, the, uh, Julie, I should say, we've been raising money for the food shelf, and now it's all going to go for refugee services. So uh, food would be okay, but we're actually looking for items that are more appropriate for somebody new to the United States and to a local community, either here or St. Cloud or the Twin Cities. That could include clothing or linen or personal hygiene items that you may not have with you on a long trip where you're fleeing uh, economic disparity or political persecution and uh, you'll know what to bring. We're also going to be having boxes downstairs that we'll collect, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Moving on, we do have our midweek Lenten programs, and they've been going very well. We've had around 30 people each week, and it's amazing that the uh, number of folks uh, from our community that have been joining us, it's just very heartening. Um, uh, uh, a gal, a, a nun named Rita from the Catholic Church was here. Alex and Alan and, oh my goodness, it just goes on and on. The folks that uh, caught wind of the refugee crisis and want to learn more. This coming week we have, did, did those transitions get back in there again? Isn't that crazy? And I checked that this morning. <laughs> We have a women's fellowship meeting coming up this week on Thursday, and the reason we keep emphasizing it is that it's open to the whole church. So Paul, if you want to come, I can come. Guys and gals are welcome, and uh, what an amazing presentation it will be. Uh, Mary Kruger of the Douglas County Senior uh, Coordinator will be there to talk about Alzheimer's, dementia, and the resources that are available for us uh, to support families facing that, that trauma. So we're glad you're here today. Let's take a moment to uh, greet those around us. Let them know how good it is to be here at First Congregational United Church of Christ, where people believe, belong, and become. Good morning. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Please remain standing as we continue in worship. I'm going to share a brief prayer of invocation and then we'll join together with Kathy Johnson today in our responsive call to worship. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? It is an amazing day, oh God, when we can get up the end of February and step out and, 
and hear what appear to be spring birds singing their songs and seeing the snows recede and, and breathing deeply without seeing our breath. But these are the kinds of amazing gifts that you give us day by day. And we understand, because we're true Minnesotans, that icy cold days are yet to come. And in fact, we may even get a blizzard or two before it's all over. But we do not worry, O oh God, because we know that no matter what happens, we are in your care. And though the seasons seem all but twisted around, your love for us is straight and true and dependable. And so we ask that you shower us with the blessing of your presence in this time of worship, that we may feel ourselves enfolded in your care and love, and that we may lift, be lifted high into your holy presence in this time of worship. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Please join me in the response called worship. Everyone who thirsts is invited to come to the water to drink. Even you who have no money can come and eat. Our souls thirst for God in a dry and weary land. We seek God's power and glory in this sanctuary. God offers us steadfast love and the promise of new life. We are called to be faithful witnesses and doers of the word. We have come to meditate on God's word, to be inspired by a love that will not let us go. First reading is Psalm 63, the comfort and assurance in God's presence, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you as in a weary, dry and weary land where there is no water in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, 
because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I li live, and I will lift up my hands and call on your name. My soul is steadfast as with a rich feast, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I think of you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. All who are able, please rise. Glory be to the Father. It was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I see the Fab Four are here today, at least part of the Fab Four. I'd like to invite Jacob and Andrew to come forward for a children's message. And maybe we could even make that a live video moment if I have them sit here right on the stairs. Hey guys, good to see you. And if there are any other children out there or young at hearts that want to join us, you'd be most welcome to do so. Good to see you guys. It's been a while, hasn't it? So, Andrew, I'm going to let you hold the mic today. And if Jacob wants to say something, he sure can. And then you make sure he gets hold of that mic, will you? Thank you. So, uh, today in the scripture reading from the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells an interesting parable story about a tree, a fig tree, that um, just won't bear fruit. Do you guys know that story by chance? Yeah, Jacob, you want to... Well, Andrew, you know about it too? Tell me what you know about that fig tree. Can you speak right into the mic? There was... Fig tree that... And a farmer... Each year went to look for fruit, root, but it never would. And the owner said, cut it down. Yes. But the farmer said to just one more year. Just if, one more year. Give it a chance to grow. Yeah. If it does not bear fruit, I actually, I will dig a hole around. Yes. To fertilize it and do everything I can. If it does not bear fruit, I will cut it down. Oh, my. You know that story very well. I couldn't have told that better myself. Jacob, you want to add something? Well, actually, you had it in school. Well, that's good. I, apparently, they follow the lectionary text, because that's, that's uh, the one we're, we're talking about today. So, yeah. So, um, help me understand here. If you were the, the farmer that, that planted that tree years ago, waited for it to grow big enough to bear fruit, and it didn't bear fruit, how would you feel? What do you think? You invested money in it, you watered it, and all of that. Give Jacob the mic there. How would the farmer feel if that tree didn't bear figs? I think you'd feel sad. You'd feel sad, yeah, maybe sad. Maybe even mad, yeah. Andrew, can you think of what else you might feel? Like he had used up all his money and wasted it. Wasted it. That's a really good word. Yeah, wasted it. Have you ever put a lot of energy into doing something and then had it fail and just be really frustrated? Like, oh man, I wasted all that time. And I'm guessing that's exactly what that farmer was feeling about that one fig tree. All the other ones were bearing fruit. What's wrong with this guy? So, okay. Now, this is a little goofy, but how do you think the fig tree was feeling? 
when he started hearing that, assuming fig trees could think, right? <laughs> what, what might that tree have thought when he heard the farmer say, you know, this tree's been a waste of my time. If it doesn't grow, any ideas? Sad. Sad, yeah. Nobody wants to be thought of in those ways. And then how about the, that, uh, that good gardener? He said, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm going to dig a trench around it. I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to give this tree every chance in the world to grow and produce fruit. How was he feeling about the tree? What do you think? He could have been just like the farmer. He could have said, no, you're right. Let's just cut it down. Let's make room for a better tree that's going to actually produce fruit. But he, he doesn't. He says, let's give it another chance. Let's give it another chance. Has anybody ever given you a second chance? Yeah? Can you tell the story about that? You remember a time when somebody said, well, you may not have done it this time, but I'm going to give you one more try. Can you think of a, an example? Doesn't come to mind, but we, we've all had those second chances, yeah? And how do you feel when you get that second chance? Glad. Pretty glad, yeah. It's a pretty amazing moment when somebody says, you know, I care about you. I love you. There's enough grace here between the two of us where I'm going to give you another chance. Well, that's a snapshot, that's a picture of the relationship that we have with God. I think Luke tells the story in Jesus. He wants the people in that early church to know that that's how God sees you. If you ever mess up like I've messed up, if you ever make mistakes like I've made mistakes, it's really good to know that the God who created you in love gives you another chance. And then after that, another chance. And if, and if you need another chance, another chance after that. God is not a God of last chances. That's the, that's the good news of the gospel. All right, well, you guys have been amazing today, considering you just found out like five minutes ago you were going to come up here. Any closing words or thoughts before we have a quick prayer? All right, let's bow for a prayer, shall we? For your love, and we thank you for second chances, and we thank you, oh God, that you have called us to be a people who rely on your grace and who are graceful towards others. May we be so loving towards our brothers, our families, and everyone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys. Good job today. Let
let nothing shake all now mystic you shall be bright at last be still my soul the waves and winds still know his voice who I said I'd be getting back to this, uh, this experience of my mother-in-law's passing. And, and I just want to say, and, and you all who have gone through this know exactly what I mean, that you, you learn so much in that process. Um, certainly, we learn much to our delight how well-loved Norma was in the community. Uh, initially, when we talked about whether or not to have a service, uh, my father-in-law said, well, why would we do that? Who's going to come? You know, she's older, and, and yet we had a hundred-some people from uh, Red Wing and Austin and all of her family, from Don's family from Spring Valley and around, and my brothers and sisters drove down from the Twin Cities, and it, and it was a celebration of life. So what an affirmation just to know that, you know, after 84 years of living, um, there were people there who recognized her, her humble spirit and her loving heart and wanted to come and honor her. And, and you learn all kinds of other things. You know, I was doing a little research. She was born in 1931, and I, I had no clue that that year uh, was just filled with such calamity and tragedy. Which explains a lot about her, you know, she, she tended to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. But, you know, those were the years, just two years after the Wall Street crash and, and uh, the years of the dust bowls and the droughts and uh, devastation, uh, not only of a, a financial crash of the nation, but um, war and the rumbles of war just a few years later. And, and yet, uh, she persevered. I... I had never made this connection before, but it was, uh, it was in the year, uh, uh, four years later, or, or eight years later, that um, the uh, movie, in 1939, that's what I'm looking for, that uh, Dorothy Gale and The Wizard of Oz came out. And it was an immensely popular movie. And uh, it never dawned on me that for the folks who were seeing that movie, Dorothy Gale represented that generation. You know, she, she resisted um, becoming uh, uh, overcome by the, the, the problems of the day. There were lions and tigers and bears and witches' spells and flying monkeys and, and evil guards, and yet she was plucky and resourceful, and she managed to get through all of that intact. And uh, so it's no wonder it was a, a popular movie because it, it epitomized the people of that generation good folks like yourselves who have gone through much more than that. And then um, at, the, at the reception, my son was there with Noel, and um, she'll be three months old in just a little few days here. And, and I have to tell you, that, that was an amazing uh, moment because uh, there she was at times over a little baby. But when I think about uh, my relationship with my son, um, things were sometimes tense growing up, you know, as, as always between a parent and a, and a loved child. And there were sometimes some great distances between us. But something happened that I had never could have predicted uh, even a few months ago when Noel was born, that when this little baby came into our life, suddenly... Uh, grandpa mellowed and son mellowed and suddenly we got reconnected again in ways that I, I never would have imagined. So you learn all about life and you learn about second chances and um, it was an amazing day, a celebration of life, an affirmation of new life and that is I guess as good as it gets 
for you and me. Um, every one of us has been there and may be there again. And just to know that we will get through it, that the love of God and the love of one another is sufficient to get us through it, uh, makes all the difference. It, it becomes the, the foundation on which you can stand and face whatever life throws in your path. I want to thank you for your prayers and cards and flowers and uh, well wishes. Um, it has made a, a huge difference for Susan and for I. So now we're about the job of getting back to a new norm. Hopefully uh, Dad will visit more often now and uh, you'll get a chance to know him and love him as I have. And uh, we'll just see where God leads us. As we enter this time of prayer today, I would like you to uh, keep in mind those near and dear to us. Loved ones who are struggling in life, as we all do from time to time. Loved children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren who need to know the grace of God and to know that there are second and third and fourth chances as needed. People who may be facing hardship right now. People who may be going through a breakup in a relationship. People who have just that they have a life-threatening disease, as one of my friends on Facebook found out this week. Folks like you and I, who need the love and the consolation of prayer and the promise of life that God offers. Come with me now into a time of silent prayer as Margaret plays quietly. Let us offer God our thanks and our hopes and our dreams. God of new life. We thank you for a love that is with us every day of our lives, even when we are not aware of it. For a purpose and a plan that at times eludes us, but in retrospect we see with more clarity. build our trust in your purposes. For your son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrificial death that has opened the portal to the heavenly realm wide for all of us and for the gift of new life, which can be lived even here and now Precious Lord, we ask that you walk with us as you have promised to do and that we continually be made aware that we are not alone 
But no matter what life places in our path, who loved us, who gave his life, who promised new life. And with this truth safely in check, oh God, with this wonderful truth held close to our hearts, may we be a people more graceful with one another, more loving of those in need, more forgiving of our own mistakes and those mistakes of others, so that we may be liberated to live life fully as if heaven had broken onto the earthly plane, so that we may live life more joyfully as if heaven were already an everyday reality. Live life fully, aware, O oh God, of the precious gift that life really is. And now, O oh God, we gather our prayers together into that one great prayer which Jesus, your Son, our Savior, taught us, saying together with one voice united, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading from the lectionary text today comes to us from the Gospel of Luke in the 13th chapter, verses 6 through 9. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? But sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, well, then you can cut it down. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. May God add a blessing to our hearing, understanding, and living of the word today. Well, one night after going through the lengthy routine of getting his son ready for bed, Dad tucked him in, gave him a kiss on the forehead, said goodnight, turned and walked out the door and closed the door. It wasn't five minutes later and the little boy yelled from his bedroom, Hey, Dad, can you get me a glass of water? No, you had your chance. Now it's time to go to sleep. A minute later, the boy cried out again. Dad, can you get me a glass of water? No, you had your chance. Now go to sleep. And the next time you yell, I'm going to come in there and give you a good talking to. Well, two minutes later, the little boy yelled out again. Hey, Dad, when you come in to give me a good talking to, can you bring me a glass of water? <laughs> this kid was really thirsty. <laughs> we all need second chances and sometimes third chances in life, don't we? I'm sure there'll be more than a few throws this afternoon at the annual dartball tournament where I'm going to shake my head and wish I could take a mulligan to do it over again. That's the nature of life. And to be honest, the longer I live, the more I realize that the more imperfectly I am, that requires that I need more and more chances. Without those second and third and fourth chances, we become a people most pitiful. I used to be one of those guys. I spoke with a guy like that this last week at Bethany. My heart went out to him. Why? Because in the winter of his life, at a time in his life when he should be at a place of acceptance and a place of joy and a place of, of certainty about God's love for him. He was a person most pitiful. Here's what happened. I introduced myself as the chaplain at Bethany and 
part-time as I am, and a strange look came over his face. The smile left his lips, his eyes dropped to the floor, and he said in kind of a somber tone, Oh, Pastor, I wish I were a better Christian. Well, now, I know you know what that means. It's code language to say, I feel guilty for being who I am. It means when I look into the public lives of other folks I know and respect, my life never seems to measure up. It means deep down inside I feel as if God is somehow displeased with me most of the time because of all of my human imperfections. It means when the inevitable bad things happen to me, sometimes to the ones I love, one of the first things that may jump to my mind is that God is getting even for something I said or did. Now that's just stinking thinking, but you know, there were years where I believed that. It means I'm sad and depressed much of the time, and I don't feel any hope that things can change. And as a result, I'm living that life most pitiful. But I want you to know today this text from the Gospel of Luke flies in the face of all of that. Now it may not appear so at first glance, but believe it or not, there's good news in today's text. Today's story Scripture lesson reminds us that the final word is not one of condemnation and punishment or death, being cut off and thrown out. The final word, by the grace of Jesus, is a word of hope and purpose and possibility and, yes, new life, even for a barren fig tree. What Luke wants the folks in his day and age to see, and for you and I to see in the 21st century, is that God gracefully gives each one of us second chances throughout all of life. So let's look more closely at today's parable and see what we learn about God and God's Son, Jesus, when it comes to those second chances I referred to. Different uh, personas of God, different dimensions of God. One is God as the stricter parent, and the other is of Jesus, in the role of the gracious, forgiving parent who intercedes on our behalf. That would be the gardener who says to the stricter parent, hey, hey, wait a minute, before you go bring it out that that saw, before you act too rashly, give that little tree a second chance to do what it was created to do, which is to bear fruit. Now, I want to be clear, knowing the personality and true character of God, I don't think Luke is trying to say that God has it in for that tree. I don't think that God is some kind of a terrible demanding parent, although it looks like that on the surface. Rather, I believe that Luke is saying God is more like the loving parent. The love offspring as at risk, who realize that there is so much on the line here. The loving parent who sees so much wasted potential in his, love, in his loved offspring. And when that is not realized, this this vision of what God has for us, then God feels sad, as Jacob and Andrew said. God might even feel angry. Did you notice in our parable today that the fig tree actually did nothing wrong, per se? It just didn't do what it was supposed to do. It didn't produce fruit. It needed a second chance because it had not yet done the one thing designed and destined to do, the thing that it was created in love to do, which is to say it had not yet fulfilled its purpose, its potential in life. If any of this sounds a little bit like parenting today, I think you're right on target. The patient parent and the driven parent, each one loving in their own unique ways, each one bringing something important to the parent's parenting process, each one scarring us <laughs> in their own unique ways, each one important to the growth and maturation of the loved offspring represented by the fig tree. I think the gospel writer Luke wants us to see that that this interesting, loving interplay. God who created us with potential and a purpose, who has such high hopes for us, and Jesus who walks with us and 
empathizes with us and who intervenes on our behalf to quiet God's worries about how we will eventually turn out. The two of them are working in tandem to bring a spiritual maturity and effectiveness in their parenting. That's just one of the messages I believe the gospel writer wants us to hear and to take into our hearts today. It's a message, I think, that has the power to heal our hurting hearts and to help us reconcile our understanding and our relationship with God and maybe even with our parents. A life I described earlier as being most pitiful can be avoided. A wise sage once penned these words about second chances, quote, if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving isn't for you. <laughs> My final point today is this. Our gracious God will give us a second chance because God is willing to do whatever it takes to foster growth and hope and possibility and new life in both us individually and as his loved church. You notice I said gracious God. Yeah, I said gracious because according to Luke, the fig tree actually had not just two chances, but five chances to produce the hope for fruit. The first three years represent respect the fig tree, but there were no figs. In the fourth year, the caretaker works with the tree to to get it to produce the fruit. So basically it has four chances there. But then there's this wonderful, graceful year five, nestled right in the middle of the story in verses eight through nine. Sir, the caretaker representing Jesus says, leave it alone for just one more year and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit that year, fine. If not, well, then you can cut it down. Five chances. If I know God, that day of cutting down never came. The love of Jesus Christ saw to that. A love that emphasizes, empathizes, and intervenes on our behalf. A love that goes to the greatest lengths and depths possible, imaginable. A love that sets limits and clear expectations, and that's a good thing. A love that rejoices when finally the good fruit is realized. When I was just a kid about Jacob's age, maybe a little bit older than Andrew, in elementary school I used to love to play kickball during recess. John Hightower could, could kick that rubber ball a mile. He was amazing. If you ever made a mistake and the ball went out of bounds or you kicked and it went right by you, Everybody would start shouting, do over, do over, do over, which of course meant that you could go back to the plate and try kicking again. Graceful thing to learn at an early age. Life should have many more do overs in it, don't you think? How good it is to know that God, who created us in love, and his son Jesus Christ, has given us a lifetime of do overs. Yeah, we need them. Do-overs in life to make amends with our loved spouses when we hurt them, or our loved children when we hurt them, or our parents or our friends when we have said or done something intentionally or unintentionally to hurt them. We might need a do-over in a marriage, or in our jobs, or in our relationships when they've gone sour or somehow gone off track. We might indeed need a do-over to deal with uncharitable or forgiving, unforgiving attitudes towards someone. And yes, we might even need God's do-over to take a serious look at our own lives, to change our own paths, to tighten our own grips, to get our own lives back on track again before something bad happens to us or one that we love. Yeah. Those second chances and do-overs are the good news smack dab at the middle of this parable today, this scripture reading from Luke. And all I got to say is thank God for that. Amen.
Why do we use our money for things that do not satisfy or invest our time and activities without meaning or purpose? God offers us a way of life that satisfies. We cannot buy what God freely gives us. Our offerings are one way of expressing our thanks. Will the ushers please come forward? join me in the prayer of dedication. All that we present to you now, O God, we have received from your generous hand. We give so the hungry may eat and the thirsty may receive pure water. We share to send the good news of your word to those who have not yet heard. We invest in just causes that That your your mercy mercy may may be known known among among all all people. Most of all, we give because passing on your your bountiful gifts gifts to our our brothers brothers and sisters in need is essential to living a full full life. life. Amen. Amen. of the members of the men's dartball team and their families, I want to extend an invitation to have you come join us this afternoon at 1.30 at the uh, Shalom uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Thank you. If you uh, follow Highway 29 North, 
You'll see it on your left, um, about a quarter mile past uh, Lake Lahamadu up on the ridge. And uh, there is food to eat and beverages uh, that you can purchase. And uh, we would love to have you uh, sport your red shirts and come out and cheer us on to victory tomorrow. Yes. Yes, Steve Harstead's taking the polar plunge today on whatever little thin ice is left to stand on. He'll be out there with his compatriots, and I think he's already headed out for the, for the festivities. Yeah, so we'll, we'll wish him well. Thank you, Catherine. All right, well, let's uh, join together in our benediction, and I will begin. God sends us out as witnesses to good news. May the fruit we bear serving Jesus be bountiful. God's steadfast love is better than life. God's mercy and pardon break through life's clouds. Call on God in the midst of each day's tasks. Meditate on God's presence through the night. Praise God whose waters quench our thirst. Thank God for the bread of life that feeds our souls. Amen.